We're recording. <laughs> We're recording. Hello, morning, family. And hello, hello, family. Yeah. Hi, sis. Hi. Yeah. Morning. Good to be together again. Yeah. Yeah. It's been a few days since we last recorded, so it feels really right to jump in. <laughs> and these lessons are so, so big, so powerful. We're having a great time with these. I'm sure you are too. And again, thanks for all the comments and feedback on the YouTube channel. Uh, try to get to them every day, but if I don't, it's always kind of fun to sit down and go back and, and look at where everybody's at and everything for the most part has been, been so loving and so supportive and um, it's being it's being found helpful. So that's all that matters. And of course, it's super healing and helpful for the two of us. So thank you. Mm. Yeah. Oh, thank you too. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> We're on lesson 152 entitled, The Power of Decision is My Own. Here we go. No one can suffer loss unless it be his own decision. No one suffers pain except his choice elects this state for him. No one can grieve, nor fear, nor think him sick, unless these are the outcomes that he wants. And no one dies without his own consent. That's a big statement. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Should I be laughing? That's an inconvenient truth. <laughs> <laughs> And no one dies without his own consent. Okay, all right. Well, I'll let you keep uh, reading this paragraph, but at the end of the paragraph, yeah. I'd like to sure. share. Yes, please. Nothing occurs but represents your wish, and nothing is omitted that you choose. Here is your world, complete in all details. Here hmm. is its whole reality for you, and it is only here salvation is. Mm. <laughs> okay, so um, what came to me with this was perception's fundamental law, sis. Do you remember that in chapter five? Yes. Section three, paragraph one. And I'm going to read it to you. This is a direct quote from the text. Great. You, you see what you believe is there and you believe it there because you want it there. Perception has no other law than this. Whoa. So that is perception's fundamental law. So we... so. Let me let me just share something here. This comes from the Manual for Holy Relationship. Uh, and this might explain it better. Perception's fundamental law says that we always see, feel, hear, and experience exactly what we believe, believe is there. And the only way we could possibly perceive any conflict or adversity at all is based on one premise, that we desire it. That's right. Sounds crazy and counterintuitive, but mm -hmm. this is what Jesus is saying, mm -hmm. that, you know, we do, we do desire it, but we have, um, uh, what's the word for it, dissociated mm -hmm. through the ego, dissociated and hidden the desire mm -hmm. in what we call the ego's bunker, hoping that we never will find it, right, and then heal it. So we do desire everything we perceive, even the bad stuff, right? And because we desire it, we, we put it there. We actually put it there, Yes, everything. 100% of our reality is made through our desire. Everything we experience comes exclusively from our desire for it, okay? Um, that's pretty big, isn't it? That's why the power of decision must be my own. Mm -hmm. The 
power of decision because if we don't um, re regain that power of decision, we're never going to be able to decide with God. We'll always be deciding through the deep, dark, unconscious ego bunker with the ego for self-attack. Mm -hmm. Did you want to add to that, Sue? Well, I think it really points to the recognition of the power of our mind. You know, if there is just the power, the only mind that there is, is the mind of God who is omnipotent. Mm -hmm. And with that omnipotence, this decision of wanting to know or a choice of what it would be like to become and know ourselves as separate from oneness, right? Mm -hmm. We were able to seemingly pull that off in a dream using the power of our mind. And here it's son of God, you know, what is it that you want? Because your desire literally makes your experience. That's how powerful the mind was. So that little in innocent question of, I wonder what it would be like, you know, the entire universe as we know it rose in response to that little question. So that gives you an idea of how powerful our mind is and that our desires really give us the experience. So once we see that, that's full accountability. The, the ego hates this because it wants us to be victims of powers out there in a world that we have no control over. But, um, this is a beautiful thing. At first, we kind of pull back. Of, I don't want these negative things. But if we can recognize that as we're willing to accept accountability, therein lies the um, source of all healing and correction. We're, we're bringing it to our mind. We're going to go into that some more through this, this section. Mm. But it's, it's an empowering thing to stop hiding it out there and bringing it back to its source, which is in our mind. And that's where the power is. That's it. Thank you. And, you know, what came to me is quite a shock, and this is quite, I don't know, 20 years ago or so in the illusion of time, was, <clears throat> was that anything that I feared, anything that I believed that I needed to defend myself from mm -hmm. here in the world, especially the body, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. the body is the, is, is the central idol, right? I mean, it's our idol here in the dream, was that each time I really believed that fear and didn't forgive it, I was actually attracting it, <laughs> right? Yes. So there's, there's that dynamic again, desiring it, because you can't attract something you don't desire. The only way you can attract it into your experience is if you desire it. That's perception's fundamental law. Right. Right. So this is an area I think most on the spiritual journey don't really incorporate this. They don't really look deeply at and make, make a checklist, you know, 10-page checklist, maybe 100 pages, <laughs> it depends. <laughs> And to see what it is we're trying to control in our life. Mm -hmm. yeah. not, not for guilt purposes, mm -hmm. not to beat ourselves up, but to really genuinely mm, look at it with Holy Spirit. And looking at, it with, looking at it with Holy Spirit, we're looking at all of that in the light, not in the darkness with the ego. Mm -hmm. So once we look at all of our defences in the light, then we can give them to Holy Spirit for him to repurpose whatever needs to be repurposed so it can't come back and attack us. That's right. Oh, and that's that. We're going to be getting into a beautiful lesson about defenses. That's the next one. In my defenselessness, my safety lies. So that's, oh, that's a beautiful segue. Okay. Um, thanks, sis. Yes. Thank I, you. I heard a question, though, as you were talking before, just as you started talking about, well, I don't understand why I would desire all of this. And it's always a good question. It's lovely to loop back and, and come back and recognize that if we are one and if we are spirit and one in God, um, and that little tiny mad idea of a suggestion of, of what would it be like to be separate. Remember in um, the gap diagram from where we came originally where all is peace and joy and union and oneness um 
we, you know, carved out time and space to have an illusory experience where there's a, a mythical me and all the, the layers that we superimpose on that first substitute for God, this idol. And so we want to keep this dream going. We're constantly needing things to distract ourselves um, and to close our mind off from the voice of God that's in our mind. So the mind split, the voice for God, the Holy Spirit's in our mind, but also we're running this ego thought system, which is filled with the opposites. And so we need constant stimulation in the dream to pull our mind into false imagery and to, to see it as real, to judge it, to evaluate how we should respond and to take action and then to fail miserably and then to feel guilt. I mean, all of this is all our defense against being still and hearing the voice for God and remembering that I am one with the Father. So why do we want misery? Why do I desire all of this? Because that's my defense against awakening. While I still think separation is a good thing, um, I don't want to hear the voice for God. I'm, I'm happy, you know, playing this out to the hilt again and again and again and again until we realize it has nothing that we want and there's no payoff here. <laughs> okay. Very, yeah, very helpful. And, and that also supports mm -hmm. uh, what Jesus says in the text mm -hmm. about the obstacles to peace, yeah. which is the first obstacle to peace. Yeah. And, you know, let's just say here that peace is love, you know, is salvation is union with God and our brothers and sisters. But the first block or the first resistance, the first defense is the desire to get rid of it. That's what you were just talking about in the gap. Yep. Yeah, that's, that's it. Happening. So all of that has to be seen. We can't do a spiritual bypass mm -hmm. over this. We've got to look at it, be brave enough to look at it with Holy Spirit, no self-condemnation and just say, okay, now I've seen all of this stuff and the ego bunker. I'm going to give it to you, Holy Spirit, so you can divinely repurpose it and exchange it for miracle after miracle after miracle. And that's yeah. that last sentence of this first paragraph. And <clears throat> it is only here, what Nook was just describing, that place where you go, I don't want this anymore. I'm handing it over here. And it is only here salvation is. So this is a good thing. Taking accountability, but don't stop there. Okay, he says, uh, paragraph two, you may believe that this position is extreme and too inclusive to be true. Yet, can truth have exceptions? <laughs> if you have the gift of everything, can loss be real? Can pain be a part of peace or grief of joy? Can fear and sickness enter in a mind where love and perfect holiness abide? Truth must be all-inclusive if it be the truth at all. Accept no opposite and no exceptions, for to do so is to contradict the truth entirely. Mm. Oh, now we're coming into my most favorite. <laughs> yeah. Let me do the next paragraph and then you go, because I can feel you, but I think the next one's going to really support what you're about to say. Yeah, yeah. Are you reading it, sis, or am I? Yeah, no, I, I got it. Salvation, <clears throat> salvation oh. is the recognition that the truth is true <clears throat> and nothing else is true. This you have heard before but may not yet accept both parts of it. Without the first, the truth is true, the second has no meaning. What's the second? And nothing else is true. <laughs> but without the second, and nothing else is true, is the first no longer true. Let me read that sentence again. Um. Without the first, the second has no meaning. But without the second, is the first no longer true? Truth cannot have an opposite. Bing, bing, bing. 
Yeah. This cannot be too often said and thought about. For if what is not true is true, as well as what is true, then part of truth is false and truth has lost its meaning. Nothing but the truth is true and what is false is false. Yeah. Oh, I just love it. I love, <laughs> I love its absoluteness, you know. Yeah. It is absolute. It shows right there, you know, that everything that is not of God is not real. So everything that is in the ego dream is an illusion and it proves as we advance in our trust the number one miracle principle in chapter one of the course which is there is no order of difficulty in miracles mm -hmm. there's no order of difficulty in in miracles at all right right so um <clears throat> because there's no hierarchy of illusions you know illusions are untruth mm -hmm. There's no hierarchy. That's why there's, it's, it's, as Jesus says, it's easy for the miracle to heal them all. Whereas the ego categorizes some of our illusions as more severe yes. than others, more painful than others, and more difficult to heal or impossible to heal. Right. And that's why he's named the book A Course in, not A Course in Love. It's a course in miracles. Right. Oh, sis. <laughs> <laughs> oh. But so if there was a mixture of truth, what's true and what's false in God, then there would be this extraction process. Then there might be this hierarchy of illusions and differing values and difficulty of um, healing, right? But he's saying, you guys, only what God has done is true. Nothing else is. God never enters into the gap. Okay, there's no, at no time is there an intersection between illusions and the truth. You know, and that really brings up this whole thing about, you know, God's experiencing himself here in the realm of illusions. That's not, it's not even a possibility. There's no, at no time, we can't call God who does not know of the gap into a, a dreaming mind. And yet nearly everyone in the dream who believes there is a God mm -hmm. who's experiencing the pains in the gap or the deprivation in the gap, etc., yeah. are asking God to come in in some form to yeah. fix the illusions. Right. First of all, they really that they believe the illusion is real. Yes. I used to do it all the time. Yes. And then expect God, God to come in, right? <laughs> yeah. And that's why the um, uh, the psychotherapy pamphlet and even manual for teachers, when he talks about prayer, the world's prayer is God, come take notice of me, who doesn't exist, and look at my real problem, which cannot be real, and fix it for me, right? God's over here being the perfect one that God's always been. Real prayer is locating yourself here. I and the Father are one. What God, you know, it's beautiful. God, God is first. God is only. God is perfect. And God's work is done. It's finished. Oh, that's, so that's our starting that's a relief. <laughs> yeah. Say it again. God is one. Yeah. God is the only, God's work is perfect, and it was finished. Well, we're in that, aren't we? Uh, <laughs> yes, when he created, yes, he created us in his image and likeness. We're there, we're complete, we're finished, we're whole in God. So God never enters into the impossible. Okay. Beautiful. Yeah. Um, can I share something? Why not? Um, only the truth is true mm -hmm. and nothing else is true. All right. And that means that we are exclusively 
as God created us. That's right. Exclusively. Mm -hmm. It's not, no, 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 I'm a bit human, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm also a bit spirit, uh, spiritual. No, 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 no. Yeah. We are as God created us. We are mind mm -hmm. with a capital M. We are mind, we are spirit with a capital S. Mm -hmm. So that is what we are. Mm -hmm. And the part, the part of us that seems to suffer from, you know, from loss or pain or disease or whatever, that part is the ego. It's not, it's not who we really are. Jesus has a beautiful quote here from chapter 22, section two of the text. Um, I want to read it if I can. This is a crucial period in this course, for here the separation of you and the ego must be made complete. You must now must you choose between yourself and an illusion of yourself. Mm. Not both, but one. Okay, that's it. Isn't that beautiful? Oh yeah. And so that really precludes this popular belief that soul enters into some body and that we are holy, but we are human. <laughs> Out goes that popular statement, I'm a human having a spiritual, I'm spiritual having a human experience. Right. They're irreconcilable. Yes. So we are an idea in the mind of God. And part of that mind fell asleep and it's having this fantastic illusory dream and in that dream you know rose mythical me and the whole entire gap it never became true it never became part of god and the only answer is to awaken from that back to reality that only the truth is true we never pulled anything off spirit never became matter life has never become death imperfection never lapsed in uh, perfection has never lapsed into imperfection it's not possible because we remain under the laws of god mm. so this is the unequivocal absolute it's what jesus knew and embodied and it's the way that he healed and restored and you know, raised the dead, raised the dead. Yeah. thank you yeah. yep yep two thousand years later mm -hmm. <laughs> Did you get it? Yes. There, there are no groups I know on the planet right now who are healing the sick and raising the dead. Mm -mm. Mm. Not yet. Not yet. In 2,000 years' time, in the illusion, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's funny. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. It's lucky it's, it's not true. Yeah. But um, so that's it. When we when we know what we are. Yes. When which means we've also undone what we're not. We're not uh, identifying with what we're not anymore, right? When we know what we are mm -hmm. as the Christ here, still in the dream, mm -hmm. then we also remember the power of decision is our own, like fully, mm -hmm. fully. And when we come into that vertical alignment, then we are the will of God expressing here. And that's why we're able to heal. Mm -hmm. Whatever we're seeing, you know, that seems to be ailing, we look past it, forgive it entirely mm -hmm. and call out only the truth, which is behind the illusion yeah. of the ailment or whatever it might be. There's the miracle. Only the truth is true and nothing else is true. So we are the way that the light breaks forth into the dream. Yeah. God's will shows up here through us when we're allowing to get rid of, surrender mythical me and allow what we are to use this body to speak and to do and to heal and to raise the dead. So we're reversing the laws of the world, the ego's laws, as we embody the Christ. Okay. That's the decision. No more mythical me. I surrender and I offer this vessel over to the will of God. 
and then what we are shines through. Yeah, it's the, we become the living embodiment of the will of God. We're miracle workers. Yeah. Actually, can I just bring up one more point? I think this is very important <laughs> before we read it anymore. Yes. Is um, just to back up how powerful our mind is when we opened this particular lesson, you were speaking about that, sis, mm -hmm. just how powerful our mind is. We, we made up a dream apart from God. Wow. And then, you know, we taught ourselves over a period of, a long period of time to really believe in it more than the truth. Yeah. yeah. Well, I love, I just want to share this quote from chapter eight, section four, paragraph five in the text. Um, your mind, and this is directly from Jesus himself, your mind is the means by which you determine your own condition because mind is the mechanism of decision. It is the power by which you separate or join and experience pain or joy accordingly. Oh. I love this next, this last sentence. My decision, Jesus, my decision cannot overcome yours because yours is as powerful as mine. Oof. So that's what we're constantly choosing between. Our decision is between fear and love, pain or joy, depending on if we are accepting the ego as our pseudo mind, or we're actually allowing our mind to be um, the mind of God through Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. 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 So, you know, there's a, a line in the course that, that says the, the presence of fear, and we've all felt it every day, we get a spike of concern, you know, fear, doubt, self-doubt, that's fear, right? The presence of fear is a sure sign you are trusting in your own strength. That's right. Yes. Right. Because, because and that one comes from lesson 48. But the thing is, as soon as we're in that state and believing that presence, we're using the power of decision to reject the Holy Spirit. And no guilt. Right. But it's a choice. Decision is a choice, right? Yeah. So the presence of fear, every time there's the presence of fear, we need to, because he can't help us because our mind is as, as powerful as his mind. Mm -hmm. So he can't help us while we choose mm -hmm. to drown in fear. That's right. It's interesting to note that that's as all that we can do. Like when we make this decision for ego, that we're the ego's goddess and it's teaching and showing us and leading us around, or we, we choose with Holy Spirit, that's as far as the mythical me goes. Like that's the decision, you know, what, what do I want to be experiencing? Mm -hmm. You choose with Holy Spirit, but you're not responsible for making the truth be true. It's all done for you. It's just allowing your mind to be restored so that you're thinking thoughts with God or the choice is to sleep and you're being hypnotized with the ego's so-called thoughts, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So that's the only thing we think really the only choice power. I don't want to use the word power, but that's all we can do is really make that decision. That's light it. on, light off. Yep. Okay. Back to paragraph four, this is the simplest of distinctions, yet the most obscure. He's talking about that the truth is true and false is false. But not because it is a difficult distinction to perceive, it is concealed behind a vast array of choices which do not appear to be entirely your own. And thus the truth appears to have some aspects which belie consistency, but do not seem to be but contradictions introduced by you. This is the illusion of choice. Mm -hmm. In the gap yeah? yes. between what the ego calls negative mm -hmm. and what the ego calls positive. Mm 
Yes. Yeah. As God created you, you must remain unchangeable. With transitory states, by definition, false. So anything that changes, by definition, is false. And that includes all shifts in feeling, alterations in conditions of the body and the mind, in all awareness, and in all response. This is the all-inclusiveness which sets the truth apart from falsehood and the false kept separate from the truth as what it is. Mm. Mm. Unequivocal, isn't it? Yeah. And I wonder, you know, there's only quite a, a few people who, who really are um, attracted to the deeper teachings in A Course in Miracles. Well, this is just way too much fun until you realize, <laughs> you know, again, we're not ever going to make the choice out of this until we know something better. We're yeah. going to really think that the pluses in the gap are the best that is available to us. But thankfully, through, you know, miracles, uh, holy instances, and holy relationship, we're given the direct experience of this. And you've chosen that path in this incarnation to experience this so that this won't final this will finally be seen as the cheap substitute, not even a substitute, just a fraud that it is. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So we're learning God is all and God created just the um, only truth, and truth is changeless. Is it not strange that you believe to think you made the world you see is arrogance? God made it not. Of this you can be sure. What could he know of the ephemeral, the sinful and the guilty, the afraid, the suffering and lonely, and the mind which lives within a body that must die? You but accuse him of insanity to think he made a world where such things seem to have reality. He is not mad, yet only madness makes a world like this. There again, get God is not in the gap. To think that God made chaos, contradicts his will, invented opposites to truth, and suffers death to triumph over life. All this is arrogance. Humility would see at once these things are not of him. And can you see what God created not? To think you can is merely to believe that you can perceive what God willed not to be. And what could be more arrogant than this? Wow, that's a big statement. Mm. And yet most of us, if we're to be honest, mm -hmm. most of us really do believe mm -hmm. that God made the world, mm -hmm. right? And that we go home to God through death mm -hmm. and that he chooses the day we will die. That's right. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And you just feel the arrogance of it. I'm going to, I'm going to will apart from you and I'm going to make a world apart from you. And I'm going to see things that you're not seeing. And I'm going to, you know, make decisions apart from your mind. All of it is total arrogance. Mm. The thought of me is a false God. Let us today be truly humble and accept what we have made as what it is. The power of decision is your own. Decide but to accept your rightful place as co-creator of the universe mm -hmm. and all you think you made will disappear. Isn't that amazing? In humility, accept your rightful place as co-creator of the universe and all you think you made will disappear. So the what gap will disappear. The gap, that's right. What rises to awareness then will be all that there ever was, mm. eternally as it is now. So we get to perceive truth or experience mm -hmm. truth as it is. 
and it will take the place of self-deceptions made, but to usurp the altar to the Father and the Son. Today we practice true humility, abandoning the false pretense by which the ego seeks to prove it arrogant. Only the ego can be arrogant. But truth is humble in acknowledging its mightiness, its changelessness, and its eternal wholeness, all encompassing God's perfect, God's perfect gift to his beloved Son. We, we lay aside the arrogance which says that we are sinners, guilty and afraid, ashamed of what we are, and lift our hearts in true humility instead to him who has created us immaculate, like to himself in power and in love. So, sis, see here, mm. uh, and, you know, it took me probably a decade or more in studying the course uh, at first to get this whole thing about true humility because I thought I was one of the most, um, you know, truly uh, humble people mm -hmm. uh, in the early days. <laughs> the ego did anyway. Um, but what I found through reading this and really taking this in and with Holy Spirit and Jesus was that what the ego believes is being humble um, is actually arrogance. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a big one to to have to flip, you know, turn it upside down. Um, I remember going my first trip to Israel in 2012. Um, when I arrived there, I was hit by a huge lesson mm. in that experientially. And Jesus told me, Nook, it's time to give up your false humility. And I thought that my whole world was being ripped from under me. That's what it felt like. I didn't realize that a huge part of mythical me, the mythical nook, was hinged on the ego's arrogance, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And playing, you know, uh, that I was humble and, uh, and, and Jesus told me it's got to go. Yeah. And he he just, it felt like he just pulled the whole basis for mm -hmm. the Nook character. Yeah. Just pulled the mat from under me. And it was huge, huge to have that flip and to realize, oh, my God, that was arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to share that. No, it's, well, it's arrogance to think that we could take what the Christ is and change it or, you know, reduce it or alter anything that God has done. That's that I've got a power apart from God and we've really done something here and we've, re, but we've belittled and reduced what, what God has created. But you know, I think about this from God's view. God created the sun in his image and likeness, mm -hmm. you know, all powerful infinite life a perfect love truth without opposite um one infinite eternal all-powerful being and it's it's almost like if you had this beautiful child and there was nothing wrong with them but they were walking around you know just kicking themselves thinking that they were just lowly and you know to restore the father is to step into what he created it's in our obedience that we accept ourselves as God created us. Yes, Father, I'm, I'm saying yes to what you created. And the good news is that he created you like himself. You know, the son of God, the Christ is your name. So it's, it's humility is accepting, but as you accept it, instead of trying to be a mythical me, we humble ourselves and mm -hmm. accept our inheritance and our true identity and then, you know, oh, and that just happens to be that you are the Christ. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, that Christ is shared equally with everyone. That's right. Right? It's not, it's not some special thing that we alone have. Everyone has it. And, we, and as we lay aside the false humility, mm -hmm. 
and we really embody the Christ we are, the holy self, we're going to see it and feel it yes. and know it in others as well. It's, it's to, it cannot be done alone. It's with our brothers and sisters too. But see, but through the ego and especially in our special relationships, many of us have learnt, um, have learnt uh, a very destructive habit of turning our light down in relationships mm -hmm. or socially to turn our light down, right? And we think that that is being humble. It's total arrogance, yeah. It's the reverse. I'm also seeing that we we can't commune with God. We're not restoring what's rightfully God to His. In our arrogance and our littleness, we're saying no to being in communication with God's mind. It's when we accept that I am the Son of God and all that entails that that communication is or communion is reestablished. Not that it was ever severed, but we come back online is the only way I can really put it. Mm -hmm. But it's the most loving thing we can do is to accept our, our greatness as the son of God. Okay. Wow, I second that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank so you. So back to paragraph 10, just let me repeat those last two sentences. The power of decision is our own, and we accept of him that which we are and humbly recognize the son of God. There you have it. To recognize God's Son implies as well that all self-concepts have been laid aside and recognized as false. Their arrogance has been perceived, and in humility, the radiance of God's Son, His gentleness, His perfect sinlessness, His Father's love, His right to heaven and release from hell, are joyfully accepted as our own. Now do we join in glad acknowledgement that lies are false and only truth is true. We think of truth alone as we arise and spend five minutes practicing its ways, encouraging our frightened minds with this. The power of decision is my own. This day I will accept myself as what my father's will created me to be. Then will we wait in silence, giving up all self-deceptions as we humbly ask ourself that he reveal himself to us. And he who never left will come again to our awareness, grateful to restore his home to God as it was meant to be. In patience, wait for him throughout the day, and hourly invite him with the words with which the day began, concluding it with the same invitation to yourself. God's voice will answer, for he speaks for you and for your Father. He will substitute the peace of God for all your frantic thoughts the truth of God for self-deceptions, and God's Son for your illusions of yourself. Wow. I felt that. I really felt that. So beautiful. The power of decision is my own. Thank you. Thank you, sis, and thank you so much, beautiful family. We really feel you. I just got a huge wave of love that came in mm -hmm. just then. So thank you. Feeling immense gratitude. Yeah. yeah, thank you all. Thanks for staying with us, and we'll see you next time. Yeah.